morning to uh, Australia and good evening to the United States. Uh, today, I'm happy to present Demi Kaltzer, uh, who is a professor at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, the leaders in the topological physics, transport and low dimensional physics, and semiconductor qubits. Uh, Demi has made his PhD in the University of Texas in 2005, and after two short postdoctoral position in Argonne National Lab and at the University of Maryland. He moved to China and became a faculty at the University of uh, FA in China. And a few years after, he has decided to move to Sydney, where he is a professor at the University of the New South Wales. Uh, okay, so Demi, please feel to start and we will enjoy the talk. All right. Well, thanks a lot. So first of all, thanks for the invitation and thanks for the introduction, which is actually very flattering. Um, you know, so I actually thought my postdocs were quite long and I'm only an associate professor, but uh, you made me look really good. So um, I want to tell you about this work that we just recently um, completed. So uh, the work was largely, um, I, I don't know if the cursor works, but the work was largely done by uh, Jimmy Cullen from the University of New South Wales. And this was essentially, it was like an extension of his honors thesis. So it's kind of a heroic piece of work by uh, um, a junior student. And um, um, it was in collaboration with um, Elizabeth Marcelina, a long uh, standing collaborators of, collaborator of ours who was at UNSW and is now at Nanyang in Singapore. And uh, Pankaj Bhalla, who is one of our, um, so CSRC postdocs and also sort of overseas fleet collaborators and CSRC is a partner institution in Beijing. Um, and of course, um, Alex Hamilton, who, um, collaborates with us on just about anything to do with spin three half whole systems. So um, the um, title of the talk was uh, generating a topological anomalous hall effect in a non-magnetic conductor. And you know the actual topic is going to be um, a whole quantum well and a very specific form of the anomalous hall effect that occurs in this system. And somehow this ties in with um, in fact, the very first paper that I wrote for my PhD, which I started working on 20 years ago. So it's kind of a nice way to go back to this topic in a, and, you know, in a completely new light. Um, okay, so uh, the motivation, right? So the anomalous Hall effect is uh, uh, an effect that's been known for 130 years. And um, it's, so it has a very long history and it's been extremely controversial for the last 70 years. So it was observed by the same Hall that gave us the Hall effect uh, in 1880. I think the actual Hall effect was 1879, but I haven't checked my dates. And um, people didn't really understand it. So there was, um, um, there was a controversy that started in the early 50s um, you know, with Luttinger and then um, Smith and Berger. I'm going to talk about this a little bit later. And the, the whole point of the controversy is that, uh, you know, and what's motivating people now is that there is supposed to be a sizable intrinsic contribution to the anomalous Hall effect, which much later um, was reinterpreted in terms of the Berry curvature and was given this topological meaning. Nevertheless, um, in two-dimensional and three-dimensional conductors, these very curvature terms, so despite you know, being believed to be strong, they have never been isolated. Uh, so there's never been like a smoking gun experiment that says, look, this is, this is the very curvature thing. And, um, and, uh, you know, and there's nothing else. And the reason is that, you know, disorder is strong. So scalar disorder can either compensate this, can compensate this effect and uh, extrinsic disorder typically overwhelms it. So the only proof that we have to the best of my knowledge of a quantized anomalous Hall effect is in a one dimensional system, but one dimensional systems are special anyway. I mean, even in the ballistic limit, even GXX is quantized, right? At T is equal to zero. 
So the question for us has always been, you know, can we find a system in which the Berry curvature is the only thing that leads to the anomalous Hall effect? And somehow, um, I think we've actually come across it. Before I move on to the outline, I want to say that these days, you know, um, we are lucky that we have this RMP by Professor Nagaosa. Um, so this contains anything and everything you ever wanted to know about the um, anomalous Hall effect. So I'm going to give um, a pedagogical introduction to the effects, and I'm going to um, explain where this Berry curvature comes from. Um, and then I'll explain briefly where the extrinsic contributions come from. So um, I use this anomalous whole language. And when I say extrinsic, that means from disorder, right? So intrinsic means coming from the band structure. Extrinsic means it comes from disorder. Um, and then I'm going to give um, a brief introduction to whole systems, which have a spin three half, and I'll discuss their general properties that make them special and different from electrons. And then I will show uh, what the Hamiltonian looks like when you grow them along this funny direction, one, one, three. And I want to make, uh, you know, I want to specify something here. So first of all, this 113 is not just, uh, you know, sort of chosen by a random number generator. Um, it's, a, it's a direction that's very well known among gallium arsenide people, because I think you can dope it. If you grow it along this direction, you can dope it with silicon and get P-doping. There was some growth related reason why this is popular. And um, uh, what I discuss here is going to be applicable to other growth directions as well, right? So it's not uh, it, 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 it's it's not very that specific. Uh, this is more like a <clears throat> this is more like an example. However, in this example system, uh, there is a whole effect that occurs when a, when an in-plane magnetic field is applied, and I am going to argue that on, you know, only the Berry curvature survives. And I sort of checked and rechecked the extrinsic contributions and I get zero for everything. So we're actually rather happy that, um, that um, we found this. Um, the, uh, this is the link to the paper on the archive. It's still um, under review uh, as the review process is fairly long because um, Apparently, there are not so many reviewers in these uh, COVID times. Okay, so um, what is the anomalous Hall effect? So it's, um, it is a Hall effect, uh, right? So you apply an electric field, you get a current transverse to the field. And uh, typically, um, this is uh, done with a finite magnetic field and a finite magnetization. And you can express the resistivity rho xy as you know, your standard Hall coefficient times the magnetic field. So this is the textbook result. And then you've got something that's proportional to the magnetization. So you define an anomalous Hall coefficient that you call rs. And the point is that this rs turns out to be, most of the time, it's much larger than the, than the regular Hall coefficient. You know, typically, it's like an order of magnitude larger. So people didn't have an explanation for this for decades. And then when they started thinking about the problem in the 1950s, um, there was this huge controversy. And I'm going to outline this very briefly on this slide. And again, I refer you to um, uh, Professor Nagaosa's review for the details, or I can also tell you the details later on. Um, so Carplus and Luttinger wrote this paper in 1954 in which, <clears throat> they proposed an intrinsic mechanism for um, the anomalous Hall effect. And um, Smith, the next year, um, replied that this is not possible. And um, you know, using essentially standard non-equilibrium arguments, argued that if you have a steady state, you must have scattering. So you cannot establish a steady state without scattering. So you cannot, you can, you know, this effect has to depend on scattering somehow. And then he introduced this skew scattering mechanism that I'll discuss um, momentarily. And he argued that this should be the dominant contribution. Then in 1958, Luttinger um, so wrote, um, uh, wrote this uh, monumental massive paper based incidentally on the density matrix. 
um, in which he derived just about everything that was possible. And he showed that there is still an intrinsic contribution and also a skew scattering contribution. Um, so to add fuel to the fire in 1970, uh, Berger introduced this other mechanism that he called side jump. So I'm gonna outline this um, again in a couple of minutes. And this is also related to scattering um, and it's supposed to be, you know, it's actually very similar to the skew scattering mechanism. You can also, you can just think of it as, as uh, maybe another form um, of it. So this is essentially the story, right? There are three mechanisms. All of them have something to do with spin orbit coupling. One of them is related to spin orbit coupling in the band structure. The other two are related to spin orbit coupling in the impurities, right? So in the impurity potential. So which one is dominant and how can we um, identify them? Um, okay, so much later, um, there was a person that changed the course of modern physics. And um, so his picture is on the slide. So this, this intrinsic mechanism that uh, Luttinger uh, uh, derived was reinterpreted in terms of the um, uh, Berry phase, because of course in the 1980s with Berry's article, people and, and with the, uh, um, you know, the heyday of the quantum hall effect, um, Right, people got excited about um, Berry phases and topological quantum numbers. Um, so, largely as an outgrowth of this, my uh, PhD supervisor and you know one of his students at the time wrote again this uh, monumental paper in which they um, essentially rewrote the uh, semi-classical theory of um, of carrier transport. Um, and they showed that there is a correction to the semi-classical equations of motion. Now, I'll remind you, um, the semi-classical equations of motion are based on, uh, you know, the dynamics of wave packets. So you have a wave packet with a finite size in real space, a finite size in K space. These have to satisfy the uncertainty uh, principle. And um, you've got an equation of motion for the, you know, the center of the wave packet. And there's a center in real space and there's a center in K space. So in real space, you've got the group velocity, which just comes from the band energy. This is in the textbook formulation. And um, then of course, in K space, you simply have the, the, the uh, force from the electric field and then just the Lorentz force, okay, that's it. And these guys showed that in principle, there is another term which couples you know, R dot with K dot. And you introduce this um, sort of uh, anomalous quantity, so-called anomalous velocity omega, which is none other than the Berry curvature. So I'll talk about this in a minute. Right? Um, the reason that they were so fond of this result is that it now looks, you know, it looks like uh, you've got a magnetic, uh, a magnetic field in real space. And then in this equation, you know, it looks formally like you had some magnetic field in K space. Of course, this is not a true magnetic field. It's just a formal um, equivalence. Um, so let's simplify this. If we only have an electric field, um, then um, of course we can throw away the magnetic field here. K dot is just minus EE. We put that in the equation of motion. And we see that our R dot um, acquires a new term, which contains the electric field cross this omega, which is the Berry curvature. So obviously, if you in, now you integrate over all momentum space, um, right? And if this integral is non-zero, then that means that you've got a current that's perpendicular to the electric field. So you've got a whole current. And this is completely intrinsic right? Because look at it. The, uh, you've got the electric field directly in the equation of motion. So if you want to find the expectation value of this, you only have to integrate over the equilibrium distribution if you're doing linear response, because this term is already linear in the electric field. Now, this Berry curvature, right? There's a straightforward, a straightforward formula for it, which I haven't written on the slide because I don't want to clutter it with equations. When is it, you know, how did it just come out of the blue? The point is 
this is in principle always there, right? So if you read Berry's original article, he derives a general formula for it, right? It's a property of the Bloch wave function in our case. But in order for it to be non-zero, you need to break time reversal and, um, and you need to break spatial inversion, right? And of course, if you need to break time reversal, it's not such a surprise that it shows up in the Hall effects. Um, and, um, you know, to break spatial inversion, well, when we break spatial inversion, spin orbit is strong. Um, and I've got some plots later on, but for Rashba spin orbit, you know, this, this uh, um, Berry curvature just looks like a monopole in K space. So this is the famous monopole that people like to make a big deal about. Um, and um, of course, uh, this will give you, when you integrate around it, right, you will get a, a Berry phase of pi. And this was the famous Berry phase of pi that people made such a big deal about in topological insulators. Um, so um, this is what, um, sorry, I've actually left these here. Um, I, I've left these um, explanations here just as a reminder. Um, but I, you know, I, I've made a plot here of, uh, you know, when you have a, a like a semiconductor with just rash spin orbit coupling and, and the magnet perpendicular magnetization. Um, you know, so you have these spin split bands and now you've got a little gap uh, between them. And this is what the Berry curvature looks like in the uh, lower plot as a function of wave vector, right? So if you make this gap smaller and smaller, this thing tends more and more to a delta function. So that is the monopole at the, uh, at the origin. So this is the intrinsic contribution to the Hall effect. Now, on top of this, in general, uh, this is not appreciated uh, so much even now by um, everybody, but I want to stress this point. In general, your impurity potential is also going to contain uh, some spin orbit term. Okay, so what I mean is even if you have a Coulomb impurity, you know, some ion, Right, so an atomic potential and you put it in the lattice, most of the time, this will also give rise to spin dependent scattering. Okay, so this form that, uh, that I have here, I'm just gonna give you a hand waving explanation. So this form lambda, um, so sigma dot gradient of the potential cross the momentum. This is the general form of the spin orbit interaction that, that you get as a small non-relativistic correction to the Dirac equation. Uh, okay, so when you go from the Dirac equation to the Pauli equation. So again, in general, it is always there. Um, now in, um, um, in free space, this lambda goes as one over the speed of light squared. So it's um, essentially negligible. But when you put this in a crystal, this lambda gets renormalized <laughs> by interband effects by many orders of magnitude, and it can actually become quite sizable. So it's much larger than in the vacuum. And this is essentially the term, perhaps you know, some people would be more familiar with this idea. Um, this is the spin flip term. It's spin flip scattering. Um, it contributes to spin relaxation. The semiconductor people would have called this Elliot Yafet. And it also gives rise to something that we're more interested in here, which is asymmetric scattering of up spins and down spins. So what does this asymmetric scattering look like? Um, okay, so there are two kinds. Um, one of them is called skew scattering. And you've got an incoming wave with wave vector K. Uh, you've got this region over which the potential is active, the scattering center. And then the spin ups go predominantly to one side and the spin downs go predominantly to the other side. It, you know, predominantly here is important. It's not like all the spin ups go one way and all the spin downs go the other way. It's slightly more spin ups are scattered up and slightly more spin downs are, scat are scattered down. Um, um, there is, uh, so this other, uh, this other mechanism called side jump, uh, this is essentially more of the same. Um, so you have an incoming wave. I should have really drawn two arrows. So you'd have the spin ups um, uh, deflected to, 
um, one side and the spin downs deflected to the other side. And when I say deflected, you know, you think of it as a scattering problem, right? So you never worry about the details of what's happening right in the scattering center. You look at just in and out. And there is an amplitude for this outgoing wave to be exactly parallel to the incoming wave, but it's slightly displaced, you know, either a little bit to the, to the top, towards the top, a, a little bit towards the bottom. So it looks like a jump, okay? And this is why people started call, calling this thing side jump, okay? So my first postdoc supervisor pointed out that if you translated this literally into German, you would get Seitensprung, which is actually a German word um, signifying having an affair, okay? So I sort of left this uh, for entertainment purposes. I think it's been there for like 15 years. So, um, this is the background, and I want to give you um, a short um, overview of what we do theoretically, just because I'm trying to convince you that we've done this as thoroughly as possible. So um, we use the density matrix formalism, which is um, entirely equivalent to Kubo, and it's actually very close in spirit to Keldish. Um, I have a Hamiltonian that consists of three parts. There's a band Hamiltonian that I call H0. So that's where the band structure goes. There's an applied electric field, which is constant and uniform. And then there is a disorder potential that I call U. So all the Rashba terms, Dresselhaus, spin orbit, Zeeman, everything is all buried in the H0. Um, and the central quantity in what we do is the density matrix. And this, obeys the quantum Liouville equation, which is d rho dt plus this commutator of the Hamiltonian with rho, that's equal to zero. And for the time being, this H that is written there contains everything. So it contains the electric field, it contains disorder and everything. Um, and our method is to say when, yes? Oh, sorry. Was there a question somewhere? Mm, can I make a comment? Yes. Uh, several years ago, we published a paper where we showed that side, side jump does not exist. And it's a rigorous paper. Yeah, but you didn't prove that it doesn't exist. You proved that it's smaller. It's smaller, okay. Four orders of magnitude smaller than, okay. Four orders of magnitude smaller than, than, than standard testing. Yeah, and for our, for our uh purposes this this uh you know this is just an add-on this this side jump is just an add-on I, I understand but still this is addition to the story about side jump yeah that's true that's true yes correct um so we have um but I, a question about this so when we look at the scattering problem we usually use the polar coordinates with this i don't know spherical waves yes how this does match with the picture that i don't know origin of the wave shifts this oh you mean like in terms of these partial waves yes right? uh, i've never really thought of this in this language I think there are some papers from the 1970s that did it. Jima, this is really a peculiar scattering problem. This is why everybody before us made a mistake in this. But anyway, this is a rigorous quantum mechanics. Because it, it can, the problem has been solved, and the effect is many, many orders of magnitude smaller than all, all reviews and all previous papers um, suggest. This is so, rock solid, rock solid, rock solid statement. Okay. If we yeah. have interrupt, I have one more question, more yeah. change of which all examples we discuss are 2D. Why why not 3D? Oh, it is 3D. So this was originally discussed in 3D. Okay. So this is, I mean, the discussion is just as this valid for 2D and 3D. Okay. And uh if we just start from the diagrammatic approach and Kubo formula, so yes. we have three contributions. Is it possible to assign to each some, I don't know, classify all diagrams in, in three 
groups and say that so yes, it, yes, it, it is response yes. to this mechanism. Yes, so there were papers that did this in the early 2000s. So, um, um, you know, Bruno and, uh, you know, Patrick Bruno has um, a paper looking at these. And then, you know, uh, Shankar Dasharma had some papers with Wang Kong Tse. So, uh, you know, the skew scattering, for example, has three impurity lines. Oh, I see. Right? Because skew scattering, you have to go, uh, at least for these systems, you have to go beyond the Born approximation. So yes, there is a classification. I think Daniel Loss also has some work on the topic. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, so you know you have to. Uh, I'll just you know this is the technical part, so I want to go through it as quickly as possible. Um, you know, so I divide the density matrix. <coughs> in the it's been averaged over impurities because we're always average. You know, in, interested in quantities that are averaged over impurity configurations. And that's the thing within the bracket, the row in the bracket, and we have everything else, right? And this everything else, this little g, is something that we try to integrate out. And the, the way we integrate it out defines our approximation, okay? So if you stick to leading order, then that's the Born approximation. You go to the next order, then you can include skew scattering effects and so on. And so we end up with a scattering term, which is in fact the Born approximation, uh, but it's written in a different way in terms of the time evolution. But you can see it's the Born approximation because it has two factors of the uh, impurity potential. And then these exponentials, um, you know, these time integrals, you integrate over time and then you'll get the energy delta function. So there's nothing fancy in here. Um, in, uh, so in linear response, you know, we can boil down the kinetic equation to something that looks very much like the Boltzmann equation. I actually think this should have been a partial, okay, but this term will vanish. You have a scattering term here, and you have a driving term here, which is linear in the electric field. The one thing that is very different from Boltzmann is this commutator, okay? And this commutator takes into account the interband dynamics. So it takes into account transitions, you know, real or virtual between the bands that are um, uh, that appear in the uh, in uh, that are induced by the electric field. So the reason I kept this slide is because I wanted to show you, um, you know, what this effective driving term looks like when you put in all the um, when you put in. Um, so essentially, you do the algebra. Right, um, so if you remember the Boltzmann equation, all right, you have a term, this is just the Boltzmann driving term, df dk. Um, F0 is simply the Fermi Dirac distribution. And uh, if you take d dk of that, then uh, you know the Fermi Dirac distribution at low temperature is like a heavy side function. You take the d dk of that, that gives you a delta function at the Fermi surface. So this term over here is the Fermi surface response. What we have is an extra term, which is only non-zero between the bands, because if you, sorry, if you look at these functions, the Fermi functions, um, uh, this thing will vanish if M is equal to M prime, M is the band index. So this is responsible for transitions between the bands and the quantity that uh, determines, you know, the strength of this term, this R, is uh, what is, you know, I've defined it below, but this is what we call the Berry connection. And if you take the curl of this Berry connection, then you get the Berry curvature, right? The curl in K space. Okay, so there is a very nice sort of decomposition in which, you know, the driving terms line up, you know, essentially in two categories. One of them just gives you the Fermi surface response, just like in the Boltzmann equation. This one will give you the Fermi C response because of the, uh, Fermi Dirac distribution. So you're integrating over the entire Fermi Dirac distribution. Um, interband, and it's mediated by the Berry connection. So we have this, you know, the, the, the um, Fermi surface on one side and the topological terms on uh, the other side. Um, may, um, maybe I will skip this uh, slide and I might go, um, I might go back to it uh, later on, uh, perhaps when we have questions at the end. Okay, so we became interested quite a while ago in um, whole systems, 
Uh, and, and we're going to be looking at the anomalous hole effect in a specific hole system. Uh, we're interested in whole systems because they're very different from electrons and they're very different from electrons primarily because they have a spin three halves. Now, the reason this happens is because you have these orbital wave functions, which are associated, so, so the, the, the wave functions describing the holes, they are associated with atomic p orbitals. And so a p orbital has an orbital angular momentum, L is equal to one. Then when you put the, you add the real spin to that, real spin one half, you can get either three halves or one half. So typically, if we look at this, um, at this figure in the top right hand corner, um, this is the three half manifold and this is the one half manifold. So I've actually inverted the energy scales here so they look like electrons, um, okay? And these are split by a large uh, splitting right, usually called delta SO. Um, this in silicon and germanium, this is on the order of hundreds of MeV. Um, sorry, in, in, in germanium and gallium arsenide. And in silicon, it's around, I think, 40 MeV. Sometimes, you know, you, you have to take it into account to get the numbers absolutely accurate, but it never changes any of the physics. Okay, so in three dimensions, right? So you have this spin three half manifold and what give, the good quantum number is if you take this spin three half and you call it S like S vector is the projection of the spin onto the wave vector. So it's S dot K squared, right? So this thing squared and this is, you know some finite matrix because these are spin three half matrices. So it's a spin three half system. So this projection can be either plus minus three over two or plus minus one over two. So the plus minus three over two is this flat, flatter looking band here. Those are called the heavy holes for obvious reasons. And then the plus minus one over two are called the light holes. Okay, so they have, uh, you know, very different from electrons. Uh, they're useful for quantum computing, et cetera, et cetera. I can tell you more about this uh, later. Now, what happens when you go to 2D? So to understand what happens when you go to 2D, um, you can look, we can look again at um, uh, the diagram that I drew for 3D. So notice that these, these bands, the so-called heavy hole and light hole bands, they are degenerate at K is equal to zero. Now, if I go to any finite K, the heavy holes are the ground state and the light holes are some distance away in energy. And going to two dimensions is doing precisely that. You are introducing you know, some confinement along Z, let's call that the perpendicular direction, which means that you're essentially introducing a finite wave vector, you know, a minimum wave vector along Z. So what, what happens is that essentially all the time, the heavy holes are going to be the ground state and we can boil the system down to an effective two by two system. But it's a two by two system, you know, with a twist, actually with many twists. So you make an asymmetric well. Um, again, you grow it along, um, an, uh, uh, um, sorry, you grow it along uh, one of the main cubic crystal axes, uh, all right? And, um, you make an asymmetric well, and then you're going to have a Rashba spin orbit coupling. But the Rashba spin orbit coupling does not look the same as it does for electrons. It's actually cubic in wave vector. And the reason it's cubic in wave vector is that, you know, these sigmas here, they're not exactly spin one half matrices, right? They are the plus minus three half projections of this spin. Now they're no longer the projection onto the wave vector, but they're, project, they're, they're the projection onto the spin quantization axis, which is perpendicular to the interface, okay? Um, in whole systems, unlike electron systems, so these Rashba terms can be very, very strong, okay? When we say strong spin orbit for electrons, we mean, you know, 1% or maybe 5% of the Fermi energy. But in whole systems, the spin splitting can be up to 40% of the Fermi energy, okay? So, so it, can be very, uh, it can be very large. That's another reason to look at these uh, things. 
Um, we believe that, you know, based on some analysis that we've done, that the Rashba terms are much larger than the Dressel House terms, even in materials in which, uh, you know, Dressel House is known to be large, like indium antimonide. Um, and one thing that's, you know, worth noti noting, if you look at this lower figure, is that, you know, the Rashba coefficient actually behaves very differently. Uh, from the way it does in electron systems as a function of the gate electric field. So this is known. This was proved by Roland Winkler. And then it was also shown experimentally by Mansour Shaigan in, in 2004. So you turn on you know, the gate electric field. So this is the one that makes the confinement asymmetric. Rashba increases very quickly. And then at one point it reaches a maximum and then it starts going down. So what's happening? Well, what's happening is that the Rashba splitting is driven by, by, um, by one thing. Okay, so unlike electron systems, here the Rashba splitting is driven purely by the coupling between the heavy holes and the light holes. So this is why I'm saying that, you know, this is, you know, it's an effective two by two system, but it's definitely not a spin one half system. Okay, so what happens is as you increase the gate electric field, then this coupling between the heavy holes and the light holes becomes stronger. So the Rashba coefficient goes up very fast, but the gate electric field also increases the heavy hole light hole splitting. And that effect goes as, as, as the field squared. So at one point, this effect, uh, you know, the, the, the increase in this heavy hole light hole splitting takes over, right? And, um, then the, it, then the overall effect becomes weaker. So even though the matrix element becomes stronger, the energy difference becomes larger, okay? So, so there are many, many things in whole systems that are different from electron systems. And one more thing, which is actually now directly relevant to our calculation, is that there is um, the interaction of whole systems with an in-plane magnetic field is really messed up, okay? So it's nothing like what we're used to from electron systems. And the rule of thumb is that you can just take your Rashba Hamiltonian and replace, you know, whenever you have the, the components of K, you can replace them with components of B. So you will end up with um, Zeeman terms, which look like spin orbit terms, okay? So there are Zeeman terms that are driven, um, sorry, there are Zeeman terms that contain the wave vector, uh, which means that you can actually change the effective G factor using the density, right? So Alex also did that experimentally. But to cut a long story short, um, um, there uh, are- Timmy. Yes? So when you have an in-plane B field, if I do the minimal coupling, um, I mean, the, the momentum in the Z, Z direction is, is confined, right? Yeah. So 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 how how would you still have this? Um, so you have to do this. You have to do this. The minimal coupling, you have to do it straight from the Luttinger Hamiltonian before you confine it. So in the four by four Luttinger Hamiltonian, and then you know you confine it. So you have to choose some confined wave function for the z direction. Then you have to project onto that. That that's really amazing. I mean, of course, what you said is true, but typically, I just would have thought it's going to be a very tiny effect. It's not. It's not. It's 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 huge, and it's not only that. But uh, you know, in Roland's book, so there is this uh, this k squared term. So this was very well known. But then um, Oleg Sushkov pointed out uh, a few years ago that there is also a k to the four term, right? And these are the only two terms that you can have by symmetry, right, to first order in the mm -hmm. magnetic field. And actually, the second term, sorry, the second term is also very large. So it gives you some modulation. I actually forgot, uh, what was it, uh, uh, magnetic, what, what do they do with the magnetic field? Um, um, uh, um, yeah, I, I forgot the word, sorry, I forgot the word that I'm looking for, but it gives you some modulation, like some cosine two theta modulation that is observed in experiment. I see, thanks. Yeah, my pleasure. Okay, so now, so again, uh, thanks to 
Oleg and his collaborators I actually forgot to write the reference here but you know this is a paper by Tommy Lee and uh, and uh, Oleg um, so when you grow it along 113 um, right then your g factor your not 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 I should have written tensor here there is you actually get a shear term and this is, you know, the most important aspect of this story. Okay, so I've written a lot of terms here, but let's look, uh, if you can see my cursor, let's look at this very last term in, in HS. This tells you that you apply an in-plane magnetic field, right, and you get a splitting, so sigma z, you get a gap. Right, so that is essentially like taking your ordinary two deg and applying an out of plane magnetic field. But the wonderful thing here is if the magnetic field is in the plane, then there is no ordinary Hall effect, right? So this is one of the problem with, with trying to observe the anomalous Hall effect in paramagnetic systems, right? You need to have some magnetic field to magnetize the impurities or whatever, right? But then you're always competing against the ordinary Hall effect and the ordinary Hall effect is simply not here. Um, we have the Rashba term. Um, this one, it has exactly the same form because it comes from the spherical part of the Luttinger Hamiltonian. So the spherical part doesn't care what direction you are growing in, right? You're always going to get this k cubed term. We have the two Zeeman terms that we discussed, uh, k squared and k to the four. And then um, Dima Miserev proved that there are two more terms. Um, these are actually very, very small, right? Um, and there are some additional terms due to cubic symmetry. Um, these two terms over here actually come from the Dresselhaus interaction, so those sigma z terms. And um, there's an extra contribution to the um, Rashba Hamiltonian, which looks more like what you'd find in an electron system. Okay, so these terms are small, but at some point, you know, we had to keep them because they actually, you know, they are important in certain parameter regimes. Um, so there's an interesting question. Actually, one of the referees asked this. So I don't have an explanation for this, but I've, you know, we were able to at least um, um, answer this quantitatively. You know, so how strong is the Rashba interaction? Um, so what we did is we actually, you know, we took four materials, which we think are, you know, the most important ones in the study of holes right now. And, you know, we turned off Dresselhaus artificially, and then we simply plotted the spin splitting as a function of wave vector. And you can see, I guess the most, uh, it's, it's really not so unsurprising that silicon is the last because silicon has the weakest spin orbit interaction. Um, right, but you'll see that, you know, as you go to higher and higher, um, um, so, sorry, to higher and higher wave vector, right, there's the, the, I guess the splitting starts to become very different and ultimately, you know, the material with the strongest, that's known to have the strongest bulk spin orbit interaction, indium arsenide is the one that ends up dominating. This is just for the, uh, just to give you an idea of how strong Rashba is uh, quantitatively. So the experiment that we have in mind is, uh, you know, ideally, ideally you want, um, you'd want to, you know, to be as flexible as possible. You'd want to have a top gate and a back gate. I don't think this is absolutely necessary, uh, but if you do have a top gate and a back gate, then you can change the number density with one of them. And then you can change the strength of Rashba with the other. Okay, now we did the calculation for symmetric wells and also for asymmetric wells. So this is not an absolute requirement. Okay, and then, you know, you pass a current and you measure the whole voltage. And we have here the, you know, uh, 332 is going to be our X axis and 113 is going to be our Z axis. Then you have 11, one, one, uh, sorry, 11 one, one bar zero. Okay, so for a symmetric well, what do we get? Okay, so the well width is going to be stuck at 20 nanometers. Um, and you see that as expected, uh, right, there is a contribution to, so you work out the whole conductivity. I remind you, there is no magnetization here, and there is no out of plane magnetic field. Um, you have the whole conductivity as a function of this in plane uh, magnetic field. 
And so, you know, the nicest of the lot is actually germanium, where you can see it's completely a straight line. Silicon is also a straight line because it's, but, you know, the spin orbit is weaker, so the effect is somewhat weaker. And um, in gallium arsenide and indium arsenide, um, you see this deflection, right? There is this jump here and here. And this basically comes um, uh, from the fact that in gallium arsenide and indium arsenide, you have Dresselhaus terms. Okay, so Dresselhaus terms are associated with bulk inversion asymmetry, and they are actually not there in silicon and germanium, they're zero, right? But in gallium arsenide and in indium arsenide, they, they are actually fairly strong, and they're important at, uh, you know, low magnetic fields. Uh, maybe using indium arsenide as, um, as an example, so this is the red arrow, um, you know, you have essentially a straight line here with a certain gradient from the Dresselhaus terms, right? And then you have this jump, and then you have another straight line, but with a different gradient. That is basically when those funny Zeeman terms take over, right? These are the Zeeman terms that depend on K, right? Depend on the density. So Dresselhaus predictably is important at very, very slow, uh, small magnetic fields. And then those, um, those Zeeman terms, terms take over. Okay, and now when you're in an asymmetric well, um, then you see that all four of them are essentially a straight line. And the reason is, as I mentioned previously, uh, you know, we have found pretty, you know, quite thoroughly in Elizabeth's, in Elizabeth's paper, um, and quite generally that once you turn on Rashba, uh, you know, Rashba overwhelms Dresselhaus very, very quickly, right? So there's no trace of the Dresselhaus terms left. What I want to point out, maybe I'll go back, right? And um, so you look at the two slides, um, you'll notice the magnitude is actually very similar. It's actually, you know, I'll discuss this in a minute. Um, Right, it's actually um, a little bit stronger in a symmetric well than in an asymmetric well. So the interesting thing is, uh, sorry, not the interesting thing, but for the experimentalists there, of course, you're probably not interested in the whole conductivity, you'd be interested in the resistivity. The resistivity we've estimated to be between maybe 200 and 600 micro ohms, right? So it's definitely measurable. Um, uh, the physics, um, you know, the way this happens is a little bit different in a symmetric well and in an asymmetric well. That's because in a symmetric well, this is what I'm showing um, on the left. Um, okay, if you're in a symmetric well, then um, you don't have um, a spin splitting at B is equal to zero. And of course, you don't have, um, a, you don't have a gap at B is equal to zero. So you turn on the magnetic field, you, you make this small gap in the spectrum, right? And you also introduce a small spin splitting here between the red and blue lines, right? So the physics is dominated by um, the, the in-plane Zeeman terms in all materials. And in a couple of materials, the vessel house does a little bit, right? Now in an asymmetric, um, in an asymmetric well, the physics is entirely dominated by Rashba. When you have the magnetic field, when you don't have the magnetic field, there is no gap here at the origin, but you do have a sizable spin splitting. Actually, it's not even shown right on the on the figure. So the the blue line is not even crossing the Fermi energy in this uh, in this figure. So this this explains in part the sort of different shapes. But what really explains it. Um, Right, is this picture that uh, you know that uh, Jimmy uh, did um, sort of prepared last night, and uh, this is why I was actually trying to download this file earlier on, um, which is so we look at um, um, we're looking at uh, sorry again the what, what it, when it says small e z here this means um, this means a very small gate field so this is essentially a symmetric well. And this is an asymmetric well. Okay, so left means no Rashba, right means there is Rashba. And really what matters is, um, you know, how sharp the Berry curvature is. 
because we have two bands in the system. Okay, the Berry curvature for the two bands has opposite sides. So what you actually care is not the about, is not the overall value of the Berry curvature, but how much of the Berry curvature is left in this window between the two Fermi wave vectors, Kf minus and Kf plus. Okay, in these systems, the Berry curvature is, okay, it's like a monopole, but this is not, it's not at the origin, it is at some finite wave vector. So what you, but you know, but it, it's still, you know, essentially the same shape. So if the, uh, if the, you know, most of the Berry curvature is concentrated around this point. So if it's very sharp, um, even though the peak is larger, right? There is nothing left here between Kf minus and Kf plus. Whereas here, the peak is smaller. So there is more, uh, there is more that is actually left over between the two Fermi wave vectors. So this explains this, you know, rather counterintuitive um, observation that, that, that this whole conductivity is actually somewhat larger in the symmetric well than in the uh, asymmetric well. So the last thing that I have, and I realize that I've passed the 50 minute mark, uh, is the disorder contributions. I obviously can't, you know, um, I have to tell you that this is actually the largest part of the calculations, and this is the one that I did in its entirety. Uh, okay, so I am entirely responsible for what I'm telling you now. Um, so everything that, that gets lumped into the vertex correction due to scalar disorder vanishes, and it vanishes because these terms that we're talking about, all of them have large winding numbers. You know, Rashba is a winding number of three, the Zeeman terms of a winding number of two and so on and so forth. And then you have the spin dependent disorder, those you know, skew scattering terms. And there, all those contributions, I mean, they don't vanish identically, but they vanish to first order in the magnetic, in the, in the applied magnetic field. And ultimately it's because you know, this, this, there is some, you know, this effective field that is associated with the impurities. It goes like sigma dot something cross, you know, K prime. This something is a function of K and it's in plane. And then you have in plane cross in plane and that gives you out of plane. So even though this thing is complex, right? It actually points out of the plane and that actually simplifies the algebra enormously. And everything that you're, that you're left with has some large winding number and turns out to average to zero. So I conclude, right, that first of all, in a whole quantum well, you get this funny hole effect that's linear in an in-plane magnetic field. And um, uh, the, the only surviving contribution is that due to the Berry curvature, uh, there are several origins. There is a shear term in the G tensor. There are uh, these in-plane Zeeman terms that mix the magnetic field with the wave vector. There's the Rashba term, there's the Dresselhaus terms. Ultimately, there's no disorder of contribution. So I want to argue that if this thing is observed experimentally, then it can act as a probe uh, of the Berry curvature. And with this, I'll thank you for your attention and we can open the floor uh, to questions. Thank you for a nice talk. Uh, do we have any questions? Uh, may I ask a question? Yeah. Sure. Jimmy, I just want to understand. Uh, I understand, of course, in real materials, there are, there are many effects this. Rush, but, uh, intrinsic rush, but dressing house, et cetera, et cetera. This, um, uh, uh, magnetization, mag magnetization tensor, and, and all other things. But, yeah. but to, to get the idea, assume that you have only cubic rush bar, only, and yes. all other effects are negligible. Or probably in germanium, do you have uh, anisotropic tensor, magnetic tensor? I forgot. Yes, yes. You still, but anyway. Oh, 113, yeah. 113. Yeah. Let, let's throw away all this and in, uh, most important, throw away anisotropic tensor, magnetic tensor. Do you have the effect or? You no, don't? no, it, everything oh, okay. comes from, everything comes from gamma three, right? So, so the Luttinger parameters, right? Uh, so you say that anisotropic tensor is essential for you, magnetic. Yeah. 
And that's that's in Tommy's paper as well, right? Oh, okay. So, uh, Good. The G's that, that, uh, Jimmy, no, yeah. Answer my question. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. So, um, could, could I, 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 so I, I can I have a, a, ask a question? Um, yeah. So, sure. So, Jimmy, I've been a loyal follower of your work for 20 years. Uh, so that's a very, very nice talk. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I, I have a question. I, it's probably a more general question because I think yeah. this idea is really nice. So there are a lot of two, two tag system in addition to uh, the quantum oils, or of course, many two dimensional materials. So, yeah. so I, I'm wondering, could you comment on the symmetry aspect, um, uh, particularly to have Hoy effect, uh, you need a break, several mirror uh, planes, right? Um, uh, so, so let's say you, 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 let's say you have a rash bar, so mirror is gone, you have a B field in the X direction, so, so mirror Y is gone, but, but, but uh, if the mirror X is, is still there, that, that still prohibit a, a whole effect. Um, mirror X, uh, mirror X, but you have this, uh, Sigma Z B X. What does that do under mirror X? Oh, that. Uh, sorry, sorry. You the couple to Sigma Z. Okay, yeah. I see. So now, so is there any way? Let's say I have a different uh, two two tag system, right? Yeah. Um. Is there a way like to to tell without you know doing all those uh, not injured or you just just derive the effective Hamiltonian? Let's say, hey, this could be another system that could give us. So the planar whole effect, right? Yeah, I don't know. So the, it's not, I mean, the, the people, I mean, you can get a planar whole effect, right? But not, mm -hmm. you can get it from Magnons, right? So those Japanese guys, uh, um, I mean, the, the, the spin orbit torque literature is full of these papers by Hiroshi Kono and people. Um, yeah, I, I'm not talking about a Magnon, just the, just the in, in general talking about the electrons. Yeah, so for electrons, I don't think that this can be done because, or actually the only thing, okay, I correct myself, the, uh, the only way you could get such a correction for electrons, I think you could get something from Dressel House, but what you, you know, it, it will never be observable. I think this will have to be either second order, you know, the net effect. If you did get something like this, you'd get. Something. Yeah, but uh, when you talk about the electron, the whole, so you really mean uh, the, the, the whole band are made of pure orbitals. So you have some degeneracy there. Yeah. Uh, okay, I see, I see. Yeah. So it's not about electron or hole, it's just the, as long as I have some band yeah, it's degeneracy. About these. It's about these holes. Yeah, it's not like holes in topological insulators, right? Or, or yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. Thanks. Dim, mm. uh, did I understand your arguments correctly? That the Hamiltonian has only quadratic and cubic terms. That is why this in uh, three so the component vanish. Yeah, and then there is also this linear term that you can calculate. So, okay, this sigma z doesn't give you anything, right? The Dressel House sigma z, that's another big advantage here. Uh, but you have this, you know, linear Rajpa term, but the linear Rajpa term, you know, you can calculate separately. And that one, of course, will give you zero because it's killed by disorder. It's killed by scalar disorder. Okay. And also in so linear Rashpa also in combination with spin orbit disorder with spin orbit scattering will also give you zero. That was again was shown by Giovanni Vignale uh, maybe 15 years ago. So yeah, that, that... so this statement is very strong for any disorder. Yeah. Extreme yeah, it is extreme component does disappear. Right. For the scalar disorder, magnetic disorder. Yes. Know. I believe so, yes. Disorder that, has, that have also some spin orbit coupling. I believe so, yes. Oh. Fantastic. Yeah, so uh, we're all waiting for Alex to do the experiment. I don't know if he's listening, but... Uh...
Yeah. If not, perhaps somebody could nudge him. I, I'm, I have nothing good to say. <laughs> no, it, it's 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 doable, and and you know, um, it, it it's very interesting, and it, that it comes out, you know, of this GXZ term, which is a very very strange term. Yeah. So all of this, you know, there's a lot. Yeah, there, there's a lot of history going into this paper, right? So. So the anomalous, the anomalous hole in paramagnets was my very first PhD paper, you know, then, then all of this stuff shows up in, in spin hall. And then of course I, you know, I, I uh, really, I guess the most inspiring paper for me was the one by Tommy Lee and uh, Oleg Sushkov, uh, right? Where they showed that, that this GZX term is there. Yeah. Okay, uh, any other questions? Um, yeah. well, I, oh, sorry, Oli. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you very much for this nice talk. Uh, yes, I guess I have a small question. At the end, you, you showed uh, some picture of the Berry curvature, showing that it is um, sharper for the asymmetric well. Yeah. And I, I was wondering how it uh, connect uh, to the band structure that you showed previously. Yeah. Because uh, usually, uh, I mean, we, I guess usually the Berry curvature, we assume that it is maximized. Okay, often it is maximized where the, uh, the gap between the two bands is minimum. Yeah. And uh, so it, it seems that it's not the case here. Uh, no, so that's for linear Rashba and linear Dressel house. But if uh, you know, if you work it out, so I, 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 it would have been easier if I had written down the formulas. But essentially, you know, the Berry curvature. Just think of it as it's a fraction, right? You have a numerator and the de in a denominator, and in for linear dispersion, so linear Rashba or Dressel house. Your denominator, so your numerator just has, you know, a function of the gap. So you're absolutely right. You know, it's what the size of the gap, that's what's in the numerator. And in the denominator, you have some power of K, which I think is around K cubed, right? And um, um, so, yes, you get a peak at the origin and then it decays away from it with, you know, with, with some strength, right? So with yeah. some speed. Now, um, if your dispersion is like k squared or k cubed, then your numerator also contains k dependent terms. So it has to vanish at the origin. Right? Aha, aha, aha. Yes, okay. I, yes, okay. Oh, it okay. does have to vanish at the origin. And then your denominator is going to contain, you know, whatever the spin orbit field is squared. So if it is, you know, k, not, not squared, but to the third power. Right, so if we are in this, uh, you know, case on the left where you have a, uh, a Zeeman term, Zeeman goes as k squared, and then that will give you k take to the six. But then Rashba goes as k cubed, so that will give you k to the nine. Okay, so it will decay much faster. So you are absolutely right. It is 100% related to the band structure that I showed earlier. Uh -huh, but uh, it's uh, yeah, it's different than just the as a linear as by I see. Yeah, okay. Yeah, just higher powers. No. Um, yeah, but okay. you know, to 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 I I sympathize because you know the very first time I worked it out for cubic rush by you know and I plotted it and I was looking like what the hell it's supposed to be a, to have a peak at the origin and then I actually look at the equation and I said no okay no it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, does it mean that, uh, do I understand well that then it means that the in-plane um, winding of the, of Rajba or, or yes. is, uh, in, is not one, but like two or, or, or uh, three? Yes, for, for Rajba, it's actually three. Three, right? yeah, okay, so, so it yeah. doesn't change things. For whole Rajba, yeah, so then, yeah. Okay, thank you. My pleasure. Augustine? Uh, yeah, uh, just quickly, Dimi, uh, how are you? Um, I have a question regarding your, uh, that spin dependent scattering in the beginning. Yeah. Um, can you quantify the probability 
uh, that spin selectivity. Uh, yes, the, the top diagram. Yeah. As, and, and as a function of spin orbit coupling, is that something that's quantifiable? Uh, so in what's in what's in what sense? So it usually so for a scalar band structure, it will go with spin orbit squared. Well, I'm just thinking of um, I'm I'm just thinking out loud of an experiment. Imagine if I have a a C of um, two D uh, electrons, free electrons, so quadratic dispersion, and I put a single atom. Um, with significant spin orbit coupling. Yeah. So you said that it's not that all spin ups go left and all spin ups, spin downs go right, that there was some. Um, a fraction of them, yes. A fraction. So, what's, can you quantify that fraction as a function of spin orbit coupling? Is that something reliable? Uh, yes, yes, you can. I, I think it actually goes as spin orbit squared. Yeah, so this oh, okay. will supposedly give you what you're describing is basically uh, is basically spin hole, you know, in uh, in uh, a system that has no band structure, spin orbit coupling. What you're thinking about is the extrinsic spin hole effect, where you have only the scattering centers and these. You know, so you know that they flip. No, they 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 send the spins predominantly one you know in one direction, and then in principle this could give you a spin up accumulation on one uh, edge and a spin down on the other edge. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so do you know if anybody but, but, looked at this at the scale of a single atom? Uh, no, well, so I think uh, Oleg might know this because atomic physics people like to do this, right? So they shoot like beams of, what is it? Beams of electrons or beams of atoms, right? And, and uh, they watch them being deflected, but I, I don't know about these experiments. I mean, I, don't, I cannot describe these experiments, not, not this very second. Okay. But if you're thinking about the an, uh, at the level of an atom in a solid, I'm not entirely sure. I don't think so. Okay. Yeah, I will look into that. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Tim. Thanks a lot. Nice talk. <laughs> bye bye. Okay. Any other questions? If not, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you, Dimit. Great talk. Thanks. Thanks for. Yeah. Yeah.